Welcome to the 2019 Answers at Build Faith seminar. We're going to be, of course, dealing with this issue of Calvinism today. I want to ask what I think are pertinent questions, and I say that because I want to suggest to you at the front, we can't uh, really uh, spend a lot of time on it, but this stuff does matter. And there are important questions about Calvinism. Who, who does God love? Uh, for who did God's son die? Who were the elect? That word used over 20 times in the New Testament, um, the adjective elect, uh, is believing, is trusting Christ. Is that a work? Because we know you can't be saved by works. Uh, for whom is the gospel good news? Is it actual good news or contingent good news? And what conduct proves that a person is not a Christian? Now, I'll say a lot of people, a lot of people would say, well, he did that, she said that. They ain't a Christian. Well, think about that. Um, we need answers to these questions. They're important questions. Everybody has a worldview. And, and we, we could spend a whole seminar just on worldviews. But if I could just say this, everyone interprets reality around them. They process what they see and they think about it. And whether the way they think is right or wrong, it affects what they think. Well, I can remember uh, doing a tour of one of those underground caverns, and there was a long, dark section where the, the ceiling was low, and I had to crouch down. I walked about 40 or 50 feet. My worldview was I had went past the part that was low, and I could stand up. That was my perception. Reality did not cooperate, and I hit my head. You don't have to be right to be influenced by what you believe. And there's one lever that the slightest pull is a game changer in the scriptures. And that's God's redemptive plan. The slightest pull of that lever changes things all over the Bible. And it changes what we think about God and what we think about man. And so this stuff is important. It is important. Um, I'm going to give a, just a, a little background on me. I don't want to belabor that. But I went to Bible college starting in the 90s. One of the most influential teachers I had was a uh, five-point, what you call five-point Calvinist. And um, a great impact on me. A wonderful teacher. I, I actually uh, dedicated my Jonah book to him. But nevertheless, uh, his Calvinism became my Calvinism. I haven't always rejected Calvinism as false. But I say that because sometimes someone will say, well, if you really understood it, you'd believe it. No, I really understand it, and I don't believe it. Because I did believe it, and I taught it, and I, I learned it from lots of very capable people, and then, you know, read books and so forth. But just know that. And it was really starting to take a closer look at a point in time when I said, I wonder if I could make an argument for the other side. Do what lawyers get paid to do all the time. They don't have to believe their, the, the position they're arguing, but they do have to be able to argue it well. What if I make an argument for the other side? Well, that started a cascading effect for me. And there was some influence of some other people that had said, hey, have you thought about this? And so I started thinking about it, and that's sort of how we we get here. Um, uh, let's, let's talk about a simple approach. Um, a simple approach. You know, I always think of it like a trial. At a trial, both sides have to bring their evidence forward. Sometimes people bring a whole host of witnesses and a big sack of documents, and you, what do you do with all that to figure out who's right? You have to take it one document at a time and one witness at a time. It'd be nice if there was a simpler way but at some level, you have to do that. Now, to, to do that, of course, you have to say, well, what is Calvinism? What are they uh, claiming uh, is you know, a truth proposition? And then what are the verses that support that? And let's take them one at a time. Does the Bible teach it? And that's, that's my simple approach. And the problem is we need 40 hours or 50, and we don't have, we have four. So what I'm going to do is it touch on some of the really big ones. The really big verses, the verses I think candidly give a lot of people who even would say, you know, I'm not a Calvinist, but man, that verse seems to say what they're saying. I want to look at those kinds of, of verses, but that is what we have to do. Um, there's a, a Calvinist treatise, and I've got it quoted in your notes. They say this well, the question of supreme importance is not how Calvinism came to be formulated in five points or why it was named Calvinism, but rather whether it is supported by Scripture. The final court of appeal for determining the validity of any theological system is the inspired, authoritative Word of God. If Calvinism can be verified by clear and explicit declarations of Scripture, then it must be received by Christians. If not, it must be rejected. And, and that is true. We don't get to say, well, I'm going to reject the parts I don't like. 
And we don't get to say the Bible just teaches the things that I wish were true. We have to look at it. I, I would suggest to you that truth propositions tend to become true for, for three reasons. And one of those is a good one. That's that the proposition is actually, objectively true. We want to traffic in that kind of truth. Truth that is true because we can find a place in Scripture that teaches it. There's another kind of truth, and it's just as persuasive for people, and it changes their worldview. There's things that are true because we just want them to be true. If the universe were the way I would have made it, this would be true. Propositions that we want to be true. Well, you're wanting them to be true, don't make it so. And the third one, and this is the most dangerous one because it's the one that is so influential within some churches, the proposition becomes through, uh, true through much repetition. It's another way of saying it preaches well. Lots of things preach well that ain't so. And they, lots of things that preach often ain't so. The old saying, not all that glitters is gold. And, and I'll touch on that in a few places where, yeah, this always gets preached this way, but let's just look a little closer. Let's re-question that. Well, some preliminary observations before we try to jump into uh, specific passages and, and so forth. First, um, the meanings of words matters. The meanings of, of words. We have lots of big words and important words when we read the scriptures, words that are recurring. And, and you know, I find that the most important words get the least time. They're, they're sort of assumed. We, we know what that means. Sovereign, foreknowledge, repent. Repent's used all throughout the Bible, but what does it mean? Faith, you would think that's a simple one, but it's not. My, my definition of faith and a Calvinist definition are not the same. And if they're not the same, our Gospels aren't the same. That doesn't mean that I'm right, but we can't both be right. That's a fact. And uh, how about baptize? We're Baptists, it's on the sign. But shall I merely assume what the word baptizo means? I'm just saying that, that these words are like the most smallest components of understanding any verse. You have to start with those words, and frequently they're assumed. Elect, that one's definitely assumed to mean something it don't mean, and I'll, I'll show that when we get there. The word wrath, just saying that word, some people start thinking about hell and the lake of fire, except Paul doesn't one time use it that way, not once, to suggest that. So what does it mean? Uh, filled, Ephesians 5.18, be filled with spirit. Uh, justified, Paul clearly says you can't be justified by works. James clearly says you're justified by works, James 2. Well, those words can't mean the same thing in both places. Now, you can say like some did in the past and say, well, they're just uh, they're a contradiction. We're going to throw one of these books away. Or you can wrestle with the word and figure out what it really means, and that will clarify and remove the uh, apparent conflict. Um, save. We hear the word save, and we just instantly think about people's destiny. But nearly half the time in Scripture, it doesn't have anything to do with that. When Jesus uh, heals somebody in the Gospels, he heals them. It's the word for salvation. Why? Because he's delivered them from their sickness or from death. And so this word, save, uh, it matters because you get to something like James 2.14. He says, can that kind of faith save him? You've got to say saved from what to what? You can't just assume it's uh, from death's penalty to heaven or something like that. That's not what that passage is about. But just understand, these words, you know, how you, how you define them can be outcome determinative how you read some of these verses. In the word soul, the word soul almost never has the idea of the immaterial person like your spirit. It's just not the same word. It just isn't. Spirit's the word pneuma. It's two words in Greek. It's two words in English. They don't mean the same thing. They're not synonyms. But if you decide that soul is talking about your eternal spirit, then you get lots of bad stuff. So, anyway, hate to belabor it, but it's so, it's so important. When I was a kid, you know, I'd ask my mom all the time, I said, what does this word mean? And you're like eight years old. My mom says, get the dictionary. Well, the problem is now, nobody owns a dictionary. I mean, I do because I collect antiques. Yeah, antiques, I've got dictionaries that are 50 years old, but go buy one. You have one online, but it's just no good. In the old days, you have a big dictionary, it's two volumes, you'd open it up, and definition would be half a page. You know what would always happen? Some words don't mean just one thing. They mean a lot of things. I mean, like the, like the, the, word, uh, the word date. Now, 
But you can say, I got a date, and someone thinks you're going out with someone, and someone else thinks you've got a fruit. And, and someone else thinks that a date is a time marker on the calendar. They're not only different meanings, they're not even related. You say, well, he's just green. Are you talking about a novice or the Incredible Hulk? None of you have seen the movie yet, right? <laughs> Independent Baptist, you don't go to the theater. I might mean the color green, and I might mean a novice, but see, those are completely unrelated definitions. Greek works the same way. You can get a word that has multiple meanings, and how are you going to figure out which one's intended? You're going to have to look at the context. I mean, it's that simple. But what you can't do is just assume it's the way you want it to be. You look at the context. The other thing is sometimes words are used figuratively. Um, the word exalt. That word means physically to elevate something. You lift something up in the air. But when you talk of people, it's rarely to lift them up in the air. You may elevate them in status, in rank. That's a figurative use. But you see how different they are? So when I come to a word like dead, you don't get to say, well, it could mean that the heartbeat's gone, or it has this sort of spiritual deadness. I mean, you have to wrestle with what that word dead actually means when used figuratively. And I'll suggest to it, it means separation. That's why Paul would say at one place, we're dead to sin. Not always, Paul. You ought to see me sometimes. And don't look holy. If I knew the whole truth about you, you'd say the same thing. But I am dead to sin. See, and I'm supposed to be separated from it. But, but I'm still capable of doing it. See, so, so dead, it means something figurative very different than a physical death. So just, th this is a problem for us because we can get into some trouble and see these verses. Um, we cannot inject our theology into the key words and ensure we get out of that verse what we want. That's called circular reasoning. And if I make the word faith mean something very different than what it actually means, I will get a very simple verse like John 3, 16, and get a very, very complex understanding out of it, because now I've defined faith not to mean to trust or to believe in or place confidence in, but I've defined faith as a wholesale commitment of 100% obedience to Christ. Well, the moment I show I have failed to do that, which won't take long, I've proven I was never a believer. I never actually placed faith. See, you get into a problem. So just, just think about this. And anyway, I, like I said, I could say a lot more on it, but we'll come back to some key words, and I'll show you in some specific cases what I mean. So words matter, but you know what? Personalities do not. We should learn from people. Um, Ephesians 4, among other things, Jesus gave gifts in the form of people to the church that included teachers. But there's a hero culture that we have. It centers around some folks in Hollywood and some folks that throw a baseball or a basketball or a football around and some gladiators of the pulpit. And, and it just seems like some people view certain uh, nationally known uh, speakers or preachers like they are the final authority. I mean, I think there's great stuff to get from a lot of nationally known people. I, I don't listen to a lot anymore, but if, if I catch a little bit of David Jeremiah or Tony Evans, I'll probably get something good out of it. But just because they said something don't make it so. No one has a monopoly on truth except the Scripture, except God. So just be careful about that. There's a lot of influence now, especially among young people, young independent Baptist pastors, many of I know, and I know that they're leaning toward, they're heading toward Calvinism, and they're very influenced by national people who have a known name, and you can quote them on the little memes on Facebook, and it preaches well, but it don't actually mean it's so, because the truth is it didn't preach all that well if Paul would be offended at how his text that he wrote has been abused. So we'll have to look at that. But personality should not be that important. Uh, one of my professors always said, theology is about words and people. And he's right. It shouldn't be, but it often is. Well, how we talk to one another matters. You know, James deals with this issue of speech in all five chapters of his book. And he says in uh, chapter 1, verse 19, he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. It means be a good listener. Slow to speak. Think about what you're going to say. Slow to wrath. And I would just say this. Uh, and I've tried in my book, and when I talk about these issues, um, to think about that I am addressing a, a doctrine, an interpretation. I'm not making a personal issue of those who would disagree with me. I know lots of Calvinists, and they're good people. 
And if we start using labels, he's a heretic, she's a heretic, this and that, you're going in a bad way. Now, if someone is not a believer and they're twisting the word of God, the, the word heresy would, would fit. I'm very reluctant to use those terms and I have found that people who just throw it out right and left, just throw it out right and left, they're betraying their own immaturity by their words. They are. James makes clear that your speech is a, a very good indicator of your maturity. And Jesus said every idle word to be judged. We need to be careful about taking someone and essentially disavowing their entire work and ministry because we disagree on some point. And I've watched some people do it on things that are a lot less important than, than Calvinism. Just well, the whole ministry is just, just no, well, wait a second. I may disagree with you about what the six head on the dragon means, but we're on the same page on a lot of stuff. And I'm not going to start, you're a heretic and all that, but just think about that. In the last session that we'll do tomorrow, I'm going to talk about how to talk to people that you don't agree with. This old saying that you shouldn't talk about religion and politics, you ought to have the maturity to talk about religion and politics without getting mad. And by the way, no one has ever made you angry. Your spirit is not determined by what other people do, but sometimes it's revealed. That's a fact. And so we should be able to have those conversations. Well, um, how we look at the Bible matters. I'm not going to try to prove these things. I think most of us would accept the inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible. But one of the implications of that is if an interpretation of one verse flatly contradicts a clear verse someplace else, the problem is my interpretations not the text. And what I cannot do is say, well, we're just not meant to understand all this. They're just, a, it's a tension. No, it's not a tension. They're inconsistent. And they're inconsistent because of my belief about them, not because of the text. And that's a big problem. Because so, in most areas, everyone agrees, yeah, yeah, you, you, can't, you can't take it inconsistent. But on this particular doctrine we're talking about today, uh, people say, well, it's just a paradox. You shouldn't, help be, you shouldn't expect to understand it. That's not right. The interpretation of James 2 and Romans 4 ought to be consistent, and there's no reason they can't be. And um, I, we have this old doctrine. It used to be called the perpiscuity. Uh, I call it clarity, and it's in your notes. It's basically just this. The Bible's knowable. Now, I can't know everything about God, and I may not understand every verse at one instant in time when I become a believer. And even after wrestling with the, the passages for decades, I probably still won't have perfect uh, picture of every little thing, and I'm no doubt going to be wrong about some things. But what God communicated to us in His revelation in the Bible, He expected it to be such that we could get it. Yielded in faith, we may wrestle with it, we may meditate like the guy in Psalm 1, but we can get it. So to say, well, yeah, it's in the Bible, but it's just not knowable. Nobody can know that. That's sort of a, a cop-out for dealing with the fact that you've got a position that's created an inconsistency. Uh, so I think it's knowable. We take a plain sense hermeneutic. I just want to understand in a plain sense what it says. And I get it. There's figures of speech, lots of poetry in the Bible, metaphors. I understand all that. But I'm just saying, let's not look for secret codes. Let's not uh, read between the lines and allegorize and all that. Just a, a plain sense. Let the scripture speak to us. And um, beware the fallacy of limited choice. Um, it's either got to be hot outside or cold. Got to be a Democrat or Republican. Calvinist or an Arminian. Um, it ain't hot or cold today. I'm not a Democrat or a Republican, and I'm not a Calvinist or an Arminian. Smart person looks for the third side. Sometimes the third side is the right side. Maybe not. But a lot of two-sided issues really ain't two-sided. So just, just think about that, because the moment um, I take the position that I, I disagree with Calvinism, there's an assumption, well, he's an Arminian. No, he's not. They say you can lose your salvation. I don't, I don't teach that. So just there could be a third side. The hermeneutical circle in your notes, we're going to come back to this idea a few times, but it's very important in our study of salvation to use our biblical theology to undergird our systematic theology. I'm reading a quote from a man named David Anderson. David Anderson says, if we do not, we will be guilty of imposing our theological views upon the text or letting our systematic theology override our biblical theology. You understand that biblical theology just means I'm studying a book at a time, and I'm trying to understand that book as a unit. Let me understand John's gospel as a completed unit, the way it was intended. Then after that, I may compare it to Paul and Peter and so forth. 
Systematic theology says, what does the whole Bible have to say about a particular issue? They're not the same thing, and, and it's a different way of studying. Systematic theology ought to follow, not precede, biblical theology, but usually it's the other way around. Usually it's the other way around. And, and, and Anderson says this, though. This is the important part. In good exegesis, the parts must add up to the whole, and then the whole will help us understand the parts. This is called the hermeneutical circle. But if one part is out of sync with the whole, then our understanding of the whole is faulty. We will be ever ready to adjust our understanding of the whole to correspond and complement our understandings of the parts, not vice versa. My systematic theology should not create contradictions and create new questions. It ought to answer questions. And if it's not, then I need to adjust it, but not, under, not adjust the text. And that's kind of the idea. Well, I'm going to come back to hermeneutical circle in a bit. Well, let's talk about, real quick, outlining the five tulip principles. Because, and I realize there could be some here that say, well, I don't really know what this Calvinism means. Well, you, we, we need to know what it means to, to address it. And in the notes, there's a, the, the handouts you have, there's a whole lot more than what I'll be able to say about this. So at the beginning of each, uh, especially the next two sections that are in your notes, I'll have a, uh, a sort of inserts from, from my book that have a bunch of people quoted. And I'm not going to try to read all those to you, but it's to give you a flavor of what several people say these things mean. And they're all people who are, are Calvinists who have written uh, books on it. But total depravity, and I'm, I'm reading from a guy named Dwayne Edward Spencer. Uh, his little book, Easy to Find, you can get it at Lifeway, and it's, it's thin. So if you wanted to see what Calvinism is from a Calvinist, it's about as accessible and as easy as you can get your hands around. And all I'm doing just quoting what he's defined these things to be, at least on some of these. Um, total depravity. Man is totally depraved. Now, I agree he's totally depraved, but we're going to listen close to the words here. Man is totally depraved in the sense that everything about his nature is in rebellion against God. Man is loyal to the God of darkness, and he loves darkness rather than the light. His will is therefore not at all free. It is bound by the flesh to the prince of darkness grim. Total depravity means that man of his own free will will never make a decision for Christ. Um, he does not say absolute depravity, which would be like if you could only do sin. Um, but what he is talking about really is, a, is an inability. And I'll get, when, we, when we get to the next session, I'll get some more, a couple more quotes and show you that. That is, um, total depravity is saying that a person in and of themselves cannot believe the gospel. Now, I agree in total depravity in the sense that a person in and of themselves can never save themselves. They can, in my view, respond to the light God gives them. We often think of that as the gospel message. I'm saying they can believe that. The Calvinist is saying they cannot without God making them believe. And we'll get to how that happens in, in a minute. But just understand, this is a, a, a total inability. And, and many Calvinists will even use that, that phraseology to, to make the point clear. Apart from God making them believe, they can neither comprehend nor believe the gospel. Um, sometimes people think of this uh, Calvinism as being about election. And of course that's a doctrine, and we'll see it next. That doesn't drive the train. Total depravity drives the train. Because if you cannot even comprehend the gospel, much less believe it, you can't believe what you don't know, if you can do neither of those things, and could never do those things unless God makes you do them, he somehow enables you at a moment in time to do it, then all the other stuff in Calvinism has to be true. You have to have God come in and pick some people and say, I'm going to save them. You might ask, well, why didn't he pick everybody? Well, you're not allowed to ask that question. But he picks some people to save, and then um, he dies for them only. Dies for them only. And then at a moment in time, he gives them their faith, because faith's a work, and if you could believe, you'd be saved by work. So he gives them their faith, and then that person is guaranteed to persevere in righteous fruitfulness uh, for, the, for the rest of their life. And, and so total depravity, though, is the linchpin for all of that. None of that stuff makes any sense unless you start off with a person who's so dead they cannot believe the gospel no matter what. Only God can do the believing for them and they're, give them their faith. Uh, unconditional election, next definition. This is, I want to go through all five of them, then we're going to back up and focus on one of these. Unconditional election. Election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved, not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good 
pleasure, Wayne Grudem. He's one of the most prominent of all of the uh, theologians that had a real a wide influence uh, within Reformed theology, and he's written a long systematic theology um, that this is taken from. Think about the parts of this, because as we go through the evidence, this is like a really big thing that people are trying to prove, and it's got a lot of little parts. And somehow that evidence has to prove every piece. So you, you, don't, you don't ever get a verse that like proves the whole thing. Not even a Calvinist would say they can prove any of this with one verse. So it's little parts. And in this, in this unconditional election, God chooses some people to be saved. There's got to be a verse somewhere that says he chose people in order to justify them. Okay? In order to save them from sin's penalty. And it also says, not, a, not based on any, unforese- any foreseen merit, it, it shouldn't be the case that it looks like he's picked the good people and not the bad ones, if I could say that, or something else. We're going to see that that doesn't seem to work out very well either. And, and only because of his sovereign good pleasure. So um, they're totally depraved. That means they have no hope in and of themselves. They could never respond to a gospel message. So God picks some to save. Not all, but some. And you, you ought to ask, well, I wonder how many he picked. Well, the Bible doesn't say, but if I'm just observing the, the um, aggregate of Christians in the world at any time, the answer is a very infinitesimally small percentage in the grand scheme of things. That is, you realize most of the world's not Christian, and even large pockets of people who are, it's a, a cultural choice. And it's not actually that they've heard the gospel and responded. I mean, God chose to elect a very, very small group of people. But for those and those alone, he died. And that's the next definition, limited atonement. Historical or mainline Calvinism has consistently maintained that Christ's redeeming work was definite in design and accomplishment, that it was intended to render complete satisfaction for certain specified sinners, and that it actually secured salvation for these individuals and no one else. The salvation which Christ earned for his people includes everything involved in bringing them into a right relationship with God, including the gifts of faith and repentance. Christ did not die simply to make it possible for God to pardon sinners, neither does God leave it up to sinners to decide whether or not Christ's work will be effective. On the contrary, all for whom Christ sacrificed himself will be saved infallibly. Redemption, therefore, was designed to bring to pass God's purpose of election." Uh, that's a mouthful. Uh, two things. First, a lot of Calvinists don't believe that part, the, the limited atonement. They, they're called four-point Calvinists. You'll, you might hear that phrase sometime. There's five total points, and so sometimes someone doesn't believe one of them, there'll be a four-point, but it's usually this one. A lot, and you'll see why, because we're going to deal with limited atonement in a minute. Like, it's a stretch. And, and so many, many Calvinists will say, yeah, yeah, that one doesn't work. But it is logical. And it's not taught because it's scriptural. It's taught because it's logical. If God in eternity past actually predestined everything without exception, which is something I'm going to deal with tomorrow morning, it's called the decrees of God, then he certainly decreed who he's going to save. And according to total depravity, he had to. There's no other way to get anybody into heaven other than to pick some to save, unconditional election. Why on earth should Jesus spill any blood for anyone he didn't pick? It's not like God's taking a guess saying, well... I don't know who's going to have faith, so we're going to pay for everybody's sins. No, God didn't do that according to this. He knew exactly who he was going to save. And not only that, look at what this says. The cross didn't make salvation available to them. It secured it. The only thing that happens later when they hear the gospel is they become aware in real time that they're elect. Right? They're not saved by their faith. They're saved by the cross at that moment. Sometime in the, in the first century, in the early 30s A.D., that, that, res, that uh, crucifixion secured it. And notice it said the gifts of faith and repentance. So we're going to really key in on that later because, you know, there's a lot said here. Was there really a verse that says that faith is given to people? No one would believe unless God gave them the faith. That's the idea. So we have to look for those kind of uh, texts. Um, the next one uh, is Irresistible Grace. I'm going to quote another uh, Calvinist author on this, and this is um, a book by S- uh, David Steele, Curtis Thomas, and uh, S. Lance Quinn. This is another one. I mentioned the one by Dave uh, Dwayne Spencer. Uh, this one is like, the, like his, just thicker. 
but its whole purpose is just to give people an overview of, of Calvinism from a Calvinist perspective, and it's just it's very well written, very methodical, and uh, represents you know it represents the view well. So, uh, therefore, the Holy Spirit, in order to bring God's elect to salvation, see that's our problem. You're not capable of believing, but God picked you for salvation. So, how is He going to get you into heaven? Well, He He died for you. But, but we couldn't stop there because there's all these New Testament verses about believing. And, and so since your believing cannot have anything to do with you being saved, God has to give it to you. And you say, well, how does that happen? That's the irresistible grace. This is how he gives you the believing. So it says, the Holy Spirit, in order to bring God's elect to salvation, extends to them a special inward call in addition to the outward call contained in the gospel message. Through this special call, the Holy Spirit performs a work of grace within the sinner, which inevitably brings him to faith in Christ. The inward change wrought in the elect sinner enables him to understand and believe spiritual truth. We're going to come back and park on that later. They're not just saying people can't believe, they're saying they can't even understand the gospel. All the non-elect people, uh, and there's bound to be some in our group, probably in the group today, and certainly in the group that will be here tomorrow, they cannot comprehend the gospel. That's what this says. What does the what does this special call, this inward call do? do? It gives them that comprehension. See, uh, continue the quote. In the spiritual realm, he's given a seeing eye and the hearing ear. The spirit creates with him within him a new heart and a new nature. This is accomplished through regeneration or the new birth. They read John three, the new birth that's taught to Nicodemus, not as how you become a believer, but how you become uh, born again, so that when you hear the gospel, you will believe. It, there's a difference. Um, this is accomplished through regeneration or the new birth by which the sinner is made a child of God and given spiritual life. His will is renewed through this process so that the sinner spontaneously comes to Christ of his own free choice because he's given a new nature so that he loves righteousness and because his mind is enlightened so that he understands and believes the biblical gospel. The renewed sinner freely and willingly turns to Christ as Lord and Savior. He understands and believes. That's what happens because of irresistible grace. The last sentence, thus the once dead sinner is drawn. That only occurs in John 6, 44. This whole sentence, and really the whole doctrine, rests on John 6, 44. Uh, the, the, The once dead sinner is drawn to Christ by the inward supernatural call of the Spirit, who through regeneration makes him alive and creates faith and repentance within him. That's a mouthful. But you're too dead to be saved or to believe, or to comprehend the gospel. Um, and, and that's the total depravity. God has picked a few, the elect, to save them. In order to make this work out, he has to die for them and them alone. That's limited atonement. But as I said, a lot of Calvinists would say, no, he, he died and paid this for the sins of the world, but it's only effective or efficacious to, to the elect. And then at a moment in time that we don't know, uh, you know, an, an elect person, they may be going to church for years before this happens or whatever, but at a moment in time, God makes that inward call that makes the gospel understandable and compelling. So that the moment they hear it, they will believe. This is called the new birth, not the believing the gospel or the result of that, but the inward call makes you a child of God. So the moment you hear the gospel, you believe. And some will say, well, it all happens kind of at the same moment. You know, I, I, I don't get into that debate, but that's what, what it is. And, and so that's the idea of the irresistible grace. Uh, you might ask, well, is there freedom in that? I'm not saved because I really got convinced of the gospel. I'm saved because something happened in eternity past before I was born. And, and then in a moment in time, God made me believe. And if he hadn't made me believe, I never would have. Um, you're willing like the fish you, you catch on the boat. You know, when you're reeling him, they got the hook in his mouth. That fish came to me of his own free will. I, I mean, I, this is me. I'm just saying, I ask these questions, but, you know, uh, but, but they would say this is freedom, but within, within this construct. Finally, perseverance of the saints. Well, uh, this, you know, again, quoting, and this is from Augustus Strong, a famous um, Reformed theologian of another generation. The scriptures declare that in virtue of the original purpose and continuous operation of God, all who are united to Christ by faith will infallibly continue in a state of grace and will finally attain to everlasting life. This voluntary continuance on the part of the Christian in faith and well-doing we call perseverance. It's faith and well-doing. 
Perseverance is therefore the human side or aspect of that spiritual process which as viewed from the divine side we call sanctification. It's not a mere natural consequence of conversion but involves the constant activity of the human will from the moment of conversion to the end of life. Now there are, um, especially now, a lot of Calvinists will just say that the P is eternal security. And, and for them, it may, it may be. That may be all they take it. Uh, the, the Calvinists that was so influential in my life did not accept the whole of this definition. He looked at perseverance as merely eternal security, which I totally agree with. And that's where like, our Arminians and in those churches of that persuasion do not believe in eternal security. But the traditional view of perseverance was something a little different. It was the idea that you would persevere in fruitfulness and faithfulness to the end. You would never have someone that just seems to kind of fall away uh, in the latter parts of their life, or at any point in their life. And that's the part that I'll tackle, not today, but we'll, we'll tackle that in uh, the tomorrow morning service in uh, the, the fifth or sixth session of this. So we'll look at that. There's another word that's really the flip side of the coin called lordship salvation. That could be a whole thing unto itself, but you know, it all comes back to uh, inventing this idea that there's a lot of people running around who think they're believers and are not because their faith was spurious. And the reason their faith was spurious is they may have heard the gospel and come up front and cried a few tears, but they never made a commitment to obedience. And now I see it in their life. I mean, here's a guy who, uh, I mean, he's just womanizing. He, he's, you know, he's called a hit on some guy and killed him. He's just bad. He can't be a Christian, right? He can't write half the book of Psalms, right? He can't be. He fell away. Uh, you say, well, that hit won't count because he, 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 he repented later. Okay, well, let's look at the life of Samson. Tell me where he became a good, a good Christian. He's in Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith. So this perseverance thing, is, it, it's something worth looking at. And, and I question whether God ever talks about spurious faith. But anyhow, that's for another session. But just understand, because God's in control of everything, it makes sense that every Christian, true Christian, will live a life of obedience and fruitfulness till the day they die. Um, and if they don't, they were never a believer. That, that's how it is. Well, I will say something just high level about this. When you look at the, the T and the U of tulip, the total depravity and unconditional election, there's a lot of proof text, and we're going to go through a few of them in a moment. When you look at the L, the limited atonement, there's virtually nothing because it's, it's philosophically driven. When you look at the, at the uh, irresistible grace, you've really got two verses, one from John 6 and one from Acts that we'll look at. But, but there's, there's just not much there. And perseverance, they'll cite a lot of verses, but you look at them and you're like, they, they, you know, there's some colorable verses on the front end of this. When you start getting toward the end, they're not even colorable. And the reason's simple because it's philosophically driven. If you accept total depravity, that other stuff has to happen, or no one will be saved. It just does. And so philosophically, it has great appeal. It's like a closed system. The pieces sort of fit together. The problem is when I take the, the piece all fitted together and then try to put it in the bigger piece of the Bible, I have to kind of shove it in. And that's what I want to show you. So uh, limited atonement. Let's park there a moment. And, and I, I picked limited atonement first to do a couple of uh, look-sees because um, this is, frankly, uh, it's, it's good to do it first because there's not a whole lot of proof text and it will, it will fit for us uh, timing-wise. And then the next session we'll, we'll tackle total depravity. Wayne Grudem says, when Christ died on the cross, did he pay for the sins of the entire human race only, or only the sins of those whom he knew would ultimately be saved? And that is the question. And total depravity says, no, 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 he, he only died for, for those, those few. Um, the, the arguments for total, I said total depravity, the arguments for limited atonement are three primarily. First, philosophical. It just follows from total depravity and unconditional election. I mentioned that earlier. That's just a, and it's a good philosophical argument, but if I can unhinge total depravity, then you can't make the, the argument that total depravity drives limited atonement. The second argument is they'll say that several verses indicate Jesus died only for the sins of a small group of people. That's true. There are verses that say Jesus died for a few people without saying he died for everybody. But we'll look at them in a second and see if they get us there. And third, certain verses teach that Jesus died only for the elect. We'll look at those. So those are basically the, the three arguments. Let's look 
It, I call this the hermeneutical circle, and I usually do it on the back end. Look, look at the doctrine and look at the proof text on the back end, compare it to the rest of Scripture. But with limited atonement, I want to start with a hermeneutical circle. Um, I, we have what I call the world verses. In other words, are there places in Scripture that just say, look, Jesus died for everybody? And I would say not only are there, there's a bunch of them. I could tag just about any kid from Awana, and they would come up with one of them. And, and so I wanted to start there because there's so many, and this is frankly the reason why, again, a lot of Calvinists are not uh, of the view that li- of this limited atonement. They would reject it. Um, the world verses, this is a popular word in John, but it's used elsewhere. John 1, the next day Jesus, see if Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Seems pretty clear. John three sixteen. God so loved the world. All right, we know that. Um, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2 says, And he, speaking of Jesus, is the propitiation, that's a satisfaction uh, of, for wrath. Uh, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know what we got to do? We got to take the word world and make it mean not everybody. And that's exactly what Calvinist authors do, and they have to. So what does the world mean? Well, the world can mean um, the elect. The world can mean all kinds of people. For God so loved all kinds of people, that is Jews and Gentiles. I don't know, he's talking to a Jewish guy in John 3. But, you know, or, as it was recently told to me, the world means field. You know where that comes from. We were talking about John 3, 16, and he picked out that world is the field in the parable of Matthew 13. I don't know where that gets you, but I'm just saying, you hear this, world means all people. Now, does it always mean all people? And this is what any, any Calvinist will tell you, well, world doesn't always mean all people. You need to look in the context of the verse you're in and say, is there any suggestion in John 3.16, in that whole chapter, that world means less than everybody? I mean, two verses before, Jesus was given an illustration of a, an iron or bronze serpent being held up in the wilderness for who? Not really the whole world at the time, but everybody that was there. That's the illustration. He says, that's what I'm going to do and draw all men to myself, John 12, 32. But uh, what they'll point to is John 12, 19. After the triumphal entry, Jesus had such a resounding welcome at the triumphal entry that the Pharisees said among themselves, John 12, 19, perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. In other words, they had been trying to kill him. They had been trying to arrest him. You read them send the, the officers, the temple police, to arrest him in John 7. They try to stone him at the end of John 8. I mean, all that going on. And what did he do that turned the world upside down? Just immediately before the last triumphal entry, he raised a guy from the dead named Lazarus. He did it publicly. Everybody knew about it. They said, now we've got to kill this guy. And then you see the triumphal entry, and a big crowd shows up because they all know about Lazarus. It even says that in John 12. They all had heard about Lazarus, and so they show up at the triumphal entry, and then the Pharisees are like, look, we've tried to silence this guy, and the world is going after him. Look at what they say. Behold, the world is going after him. And they say, see, it's not everybody. Of course it's not. It's called hyperbole. It's hyperbole. It's a figure of speech. I accept that. But you've got to prove in John three sixteen that when he says, for God so loved the world, oh, that's hyperbole too. That doesn't fit at all. I mean, you're quoting Pharisees, and I'm quoting Jesus. I'm just saying. But in that, and I'm serious, that, that's it. Like, that's the proof for the world meaning less than everybody. What about the whosoever verses? John, I'm sorry, Acts 10.43. Um, to, to him, give all the prophets witness. This is Acts 10.43. And by the way, these verses are in your notes. They, I think they're in your notes. Um, to him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Uh, what a Calvinist would say, of course, is, yeah, that's true. It's just that the only people that can be the whosoever, the only people capable of believing are the elect. But, but what it means is a lot of these whosoever verses, if God spoke the Bible with clarity and he was a master of the Greek language in the first century, why couldn't he just say, look, Whosoever this elect, when they finally believe they're in, something, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Um, 
the whosoever verses are a problem because they certainly suggest an invitation with the possibility of a response as opposed to, and we'll see it uh, in a bit, no invitation really at all. Um, then there's the inclusive verses that talk about all. Um, these are verses like, uh, uh, and I say all, I call them inclusive verses. They don't, every one of them doesn't have the word all, but some of them I've, I've cited in the notes do. But for example, when Jesus said in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, who, who could that be? It's hard to make that just the elect because the non-elect are lost too. In that, in that view, they're, they're more lost than the other ones. And, and when he says, I've come to seek and save those who are lost, I mean, Jesus even talks about the, the man who's got a hundred sheep and one of them's missing, and he's so rejoiceful, more rejoiceful over finding the one than the 99 and stuff like that. And you're like, well, it, it, it's very inclusive in its, in its nature. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, one died for all, then we're all dead. Those two alls have to have a different meaning. It has to be that one died for some, so that, but, but all were dead. In the same sentence, and it happens over and over and over, that, that it has to be all and some in the same sentence. Um, Calvinists rely on the less than all verses and I'll just say at a high level, I mean, yeah, you've got verses that say, well, Jesus died for the church. Jesus died for Israel. Well, that's true. I didn't mean he didn't die for other people. It, it, it's like if, you know, well, it, it's just an assumption that it's like, why would you assume that if he says I died for the church, he didn't die for anyone else? And you've got another verse that says he died for Israel. Um, you know, and then another verse that says he died for everybody. But they will rely on those. I do note that the, there's a lot of verses that say many he died for many. Many is an idiomatic expression uh, for Jewish people. And yes, many sometimes means all. You know, how do you know that? Because I read it in Romans 5. In Romans 5, Paul says, and I'm going to read uh, from 5.15. Paul says in Romans 5.15, But not as the offense, so also as the free gift. For if through the offense of one, we call him Adam, many be dead. The reality is everybody is dead because of the offense of Adam. But Paul says many. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And so they say, well, see, it's not everybody. Okay. Uh, but he said many be dead. And in verse 12 he said, so death passed upon all men. All. And then in verse 18, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men, not many, the condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men. That all men has to mean the same thing in both cases. Death came upon everybody, and the availability of salvation came upon everybody. You can't have all men mean two things in the same sentence. But uh, just to say, there are a couple of verses that say many, and if you look at them carefully, the many doesn't mean a few. It's an expression, a Jewish expression, and Jesus would use it in the Gospel of Matthew. Pillar proof text. Pillar proof text. Uh, John 10. So you should open up there. And this is, this is really one of the big ones for, it's the big one really, for this doctrine. And let me say this. I, I want to say something about John 1 so that I can open John 10. And I know we're getting close to the hour, but we will, we will finish the part we need to finish and we'll have a break. We're not going to be too rigid on the schedule, but we're not going to miss lunch either. Um, <laughs> John 1, I start in uh, verse 29 just to see something there that John the baptizer said. John the baptizer said in verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. That's unlimited atonement, not limited. Um, he's saying he's the Seder Lamb, the Paschal Lamb, uh, the one who will die. And, and not, not that he'll die this year and next year, but to take away. That's a whole different thing. You didn't have that in the Old Testament. And then, uh, remember what John the Baptizer's job was. He was to wax eloquent until Jesus came, and then his job was to say, there is the Christ. And what I'm going to tell you, and think about this, you may not have heard this before. You realize when Jesus came in his earthly ministry, there were people who were not lost. Jewish believers and some Gentiles, but they were not lost. But they didn't 
know much about Jesus because he hadn't come yet. And most of them, and we'll see this later and we'll come to it, they did not accept the resurrection until after it happened. His own disciples rejected the resurrection until after it happened, even though he told them. But they're real believers, and they're looking forward to the Christ. And there are those who are disciples of John the Baptizer, and when he says, there he is, they leave John. And I'm telling you something more. The first time Jesus presents himself to a believer, a Jewish believer, in this earthly ministry, they believe. No Jewish believer gets presented with Jesus and says no. We can't find any recorded instance of that. Why? They, they already believe. This is further revelation. And you see this play out right here in John 1. So in verse 35, the next day after John stood, and two of his disciples, these people by implication are believers that are with John, um, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, John speaking, behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. They heard Jesus speak and followed him. Why? His sheep hear his voice, and when he calls them, they come. Verse 38, then Jesus turned and said, saw them following and said, what seek ye? And they said to him, Rabbi. Rabbi in John's gospel usually indicates confusion, but they will learn. Um, where dwellest thou? Where do you live? Because we want to go with you. Why? Sheep following the shepherd. And so they do. And, and then one of the two in verse 40, which heard John speak, heard the, the baptizer identify Jesus, and followed him, Jesus, they, he followed Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. That's helpful. Uh, what does he do? Andrew goes and gets Peter. Verse 41, he findeth his own brother Simon, meaning Simon Peter, and says to him, we found the Messiah, which in being interpreted is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. I mean, Peter's a believer already. He wastes no time. Jesus isn't going to evangelize him, but he's going to get the new revelation that this Jesus is, in fact, the promised Christ. And so uh, he comes, and Jesus says, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and he finds Philip. Says to Philip, Follow me. That's what the shepherd does. He says, Follow me, and the sheep do. Why? They know his voice. What if they're not sheep? They won't follow him. How do they get to be sheep? They're Old Testament believers. That's what we would think of them as. And when Jesus is there, they follow him. So Philip goes after him. And then uh, he finds a guy named Nathaniel. Now, he's a skeptic. Jesus says to him, I saw you uh, praying under the fig tree earlier. And a lot of people have been boggled by that. But uh, it's an Old Testament concept. It's in Zechariah and one other place in Malachi. But I think it's Malachi, but it's definitely Zechariah. But it's the, the, in the first century, people prayed for the coming of the Christ under a fig tree because the Old Testament prophecies of a future time when the kingdom's there and you would sit in peace under your fig tree, under the shade of the fig tree. And so they would pray there. And Nathaniel was doing that, praying for the Christ. And so when Nathaniel comes and Jesus says, here's an Israelite in whom is no guile, no deception, Nathaniel says, you know, how, how do you know who I am? And Jesus said before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw you. His profession of faith, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. These guys, I mean, he doesn't hardly say anything, and they just snap too. Why? They're sheep. Now look at John 10. Keep in mind that John 10 is a bigger unit that starts in John 9. And John 9 is finishing up a unit that started back in John 7. We can't go through all that, but it all builds together. But when Jesus comes out of that temple complex in John 9, he heals a blind guy. But he doesn't just touch his eyes. He sends them across the way, a long walk, a blind guy, so everyone can see his physical blindness as he gropes around to get to the pool to clean the water out. A picture that everybody is blind until they see the light. Now, he goes and cleanses himself. But it's, it's, it's interesting how it ends, though, because you know they almost put this poor guy on trial, and they call his parents, and they're going to excommunicate him and all of that. And, and it's just the, the Pharisees are just so angry uh, that they, because they can't explain it. Because in Jewish thought, while blindness could be healed, blindness as a birth defect could not. It's a uniquely messianic miracle. It had never happened. Like when he cleanses the leper in Matthew 8, it had never happened. It's unique miracle that only Christ could do and anyone else couldn't. And there was a whole body of rabbinic thought about how when Christ comes, the Messiah, he's going to heal blind people. And here it's happened. What do they do about it? And at the end of the chapter, some of the Pharisees in verse 40, which were with him, heard these words. They hear Jesus teaching and they don't like it. And they said unto him, are we blind also? Yeah. Now you're getting it. And so Jesus said unto them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. 
I mean, the realization, looking at the physical picture he drew for us with the blind man going to the pool, is we need cleansing. Jesus can provide that so that we can have sight, see the truth. He said, if you were blind, you realized your blindness, you would be able to see and you wouldn't have any sin. But because you're confident you can see, your sin remains. He says that, but now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Now, he's still talking to them in John 10, and that's the critical part. His audience is these, these Pharisees who are very belligerently against him. They threatened this man and his parents and all that. And Jesus says, verily, verily, and he's going to do a parable, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climb up another way, the same as a thief and a robber. He's talking about bad shepherds. Who are they? They're the Pharisees he's talking to. Bad shepherds climbed in the, the wrong way to get in and, 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 and take away the sheep. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Who's that? Jesus. He enters by the door. I wonder who's guarding the door. John the Baptist, of course. Look in verse 3. To him the porter opens. John the baptizer, when he says, behold the Lamb of God, he's the one opening the door to the sheep. And you see it all play out. That's why I started in John 1. There are sheep standing around. When the porter opens, there's the Lamb of God. They start following. This is what the parable is about. And so the sheep hear his voice, and he calls their, his own sheep by name. He even renames some of them. You're going to be Cephas. Uh, then he leads them out. And when he put it forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow. Now, where the Calvinists come in is a little later in this passage, when you get to verse uh, 11. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And then you come to verse 15. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, hold 15 for the moment. This, this thing about him giving his life for the sheep in verse 11, that's the proof text. See, I only die for my sheep. And, and, then, and then later, look in verse 25. I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not, because you're not of my sheep. See, that's, that's the proof text. But let's think about that. So there's a group of sheep, when he comes on the scene, they're already believers. And, and they follow him. But is that the only sheep? Let's read on. Look in verse 6. This parable uh, he spoke to them, and he, they didn't understand it, verse 6 says. So he speaks again to them. Same audience, verse 7. He says, I say unto you, I'm the door of the sheep. Now this isn't exactly the same teaching, but it uses the same imagery because everybody knows about sheep. And so he says, I'm the door. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. I'm, he's the exclusive door. And the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. And listen to this. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So is the group of sheep fixed in eternity past a static group that the Father gave Jesus in the first five verses, or can people become part of the flock? And the answer is people can become part of the flock. That's what he's saying. All you got to do, though, to become part of the flock is enter the door, which they won't do, because remember, they, they see and so their sin remains. Verse 9 is key for us. If, if any man enter, he shall, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out. This is new sheep. And he will even say uh, in, in uh, verse 16, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. They're going to have to come and enter through the door too. So there's others. So I guess what I want to say about this, this passage so far, and then we'll deal with this verse 25, is that it's not a static group, so it can't be the elect fixed in time. New people can come through the door. It's a good thing for us. And in John 17, he will pray for those who will believe in the future. That's new people coming through the door. But in, uh, in uh, verse 22, he tells us, there's a time marker here, it's no longer the same scene, although it continues the same thought from the earlier part of John, uh, uh, John 10. It's now the Feast of Dedication. Sometimes you'll hear that called Hanukkah. And so Jesus is attending Hanukkah, and it was winter, of course. That's when Hanukkah happens near Christmas, so it's December probably. Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch, and then came the Jews round about him. They want to renew the fight they had before, prior chapter, uh, and, and, and earlier in John 10. And they said unto him, how long do you make us doubt? I mean, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Well, he's been saying it over and over. If you don't believe that, go read John 8. He said, I am, I am, I am. And if at the end of the book they try to stone him, or at the end of the chapter 8, He's been saying who he is. What's the problem? 
Well, here's where the rub comes in. See, they say, tell us plainly. He said, I've told you. And he did. You just read the earlier chapters in John. And you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Works, Jesus didn't have a healing ministry, but he did miracles and they validated his message. You believe not because you're not of my sheep. And I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. He says, you're not of my sheep. Well, that's true. Why? Because if they were his sheep, then the moment he said, you know, anything really, they would have accepted it. Certainly if he said, follow me. All this passage is saying is, is not that they can't believe, but that they have not responded to all his prior teaching because they're not his sheep. It's more than that. They're not even believers in that Old Testament sense. That's the problem. This says nothing about whether they can now come through the door and become part of the flock, but they haven't responded to his constant identification of himself as the Christ because they're not the sheep of these first five verses, the ones that when he comes and the porter identifies them, they accept. So um, that's, that's what John 10 is, is, I think, talking about. Now, uh, let's wrap this session up. Uh, just a few comments, uh, even an alternative view. I call, I call, you know, the alternative limited atonement is unlimited atonement. And I think that's right. You have too many verses that say Jesus died for all, Jesus died for the world, that sort of thing. So the Bible expressly says Jesus died for all. The brass serpent illustration of John 3 I mentioned earlier uh, it provided deliverance from serpent bites, but it was a picture of deliverance from sin uh, to everyone. They just had to turn their head and look. Now, I'm trying to imagine the stubborn person who wouldn't turn their head, but there probably were some, or some that died before the serpent was put up there. But it was a universal appeal within that context of the, of the nation of Israel. The gospel is not contingent good news if, in fact, Jesus died for everybody. This is why it's so critical. If Jesus died for everybody, if we have unlimited atonement, why do I need election? Right, why do I need it? Why have him die for everybody and then choose to save some, pass over the rest? Um, if total depravity and unconditional election make limited atonement necessary, so, so follow what I'm saying, it's kind of a, like in logic, you have an if-then. If this happens, then this will happen. If, if the latter part can't happen, the first part can't happen. See, it kind of works in reverse. If total depravity and unconditional election get you to limited atonement, then if you can nullify limited atonement, those other two have to be false. Just a matter of, of sort of first-year logic, uh, which is why so many Calvinists will themselves not accept the limited atonement. Okay, we're going to take about five minutes before we start up, five, ten, ten if we need it, to let people uh, take a break. And we're going to get into total depravity and, and Romans and all that kind of stuff. So let's take a break.